Welcome to Smoky Hill Vineyard Church. My name is Stephanie, and whether you are watching SHV at home or here in person, I'm glad that you are here today. I'm Kelly, and if you're new, a new family, I would love the chance to connect with you, your kids, or your grandkids. There's a place for you right here at SHV. Before we begin worship, let's continue in our readings and prayer from the Beatitudes. We'll read the scripture and prayer together, and you can take this time to settle your hearts, minds, and bodies as we welcome God to be with us. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. How enriched you are when persecuted for doing what is right. For then you experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. Let's pray together. Jesus, would you share with me where I am too comfortable? where I might be compromising my faith. Would you give me your courage to follow you so clearly, to love others so passionately that I am willing to risk ridicule or even harm from others who don't know you yet. Fill me with your courage today, amen. Welcome to Smoky Hill Vineyard. Would you stand with me? And if you're joining online, welcome. We're going to begin worship together. And even as those words of the Beatitude um, ring in our ears, we invite God's presence with us and with people all around the world who are worshiping in very different uh, conditions. Let's worship together. Show your goodness here on earth. 
Let your kingdom God's kingdom show up in power and authority. This is how Jesus taught us to pray, to ask for his kingdom to come perfectly here on earth as it is in heaven. So I encourage you in this moment as we sing through this one more time, lift to God the places where uh, you need his kingdom to break through. We think of uh, suffering around the world and, and we think of suffering in our own lives. And Jesus sees and cares about it all. So Lord, break in. And let your kingdom come. And you will be done. Let your kingdom come. And you will be We praise you, we praise you, 
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lifted high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. moment and think about your faithfulness how many times you've been gracious and good and generous even when we've strayed with all of our questions God you meet us would you stir up faith in this room as we worship you
as we um, sing the song, Stephanie's going to read a scripture for us that I think helps tie in our gratitude for God's faithfulness and then what our response can be. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to the strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. worship you and give you praise for who you are, that something changes inside of us, that our, our hearts and minds are stirred towards the things that you care about, the people that you care about, that compassion grows and grace grows, patience and the ability to suffer along with those who suffer grows. And come and have your way and form us to be in your image more and more each day. Amen and amen. If you're here in the room, take a moment to say hello to someone, extend grace and peace to them. Don't we all need that? And if you're joining online, take this moment to send a text to someone. Maybe there's been somebody on your heart this week, um, someone crossing your thoughts. Go ahead and send them a message. It might be the encouragement that they need today. up next at SHV. 
On Monday, we have a special workshop called Life Mapping, a spiritual exercise. It's being held at our sister church, New Covenant Church in Larkspur at 6 p.m. You can find all the details and register on our app or on the website. Speaking of the website and app, if you haven't had a chance to download the app yet, you can do that right now. It's a great resource for upcoming events, small groups, a daily devotional, and more. One more announcement, Easter is coming. As we continue to take time in Lent to make space for God, we also look forward to celebrating together. We'll have an all family Easter service on Saturday, April 16th at 10 a.m. Breakfast burritos before service and pictures and activities afterwards. Mark the date and invite a friend or coworker to join you. That's it for announcement this week. As we continue in worship, let's take a moment to give our tithes and offerings. You can give here in the person in the silver buckets on the stage or by the back doors or online at any time. Thank you for your generosity. All right, let's, let's have a little refresher. They just shared, let's see who can remember. What time on Saturday are we having Easter service? 10, I heard a few 10 a.m.s. I heard some people go, 10 a.m.? Yeah. 10 a.m. Saturday morning is when we're celebrating Easter. That way you get to have your whole weekend to kind of celebrate and do stuff together. And we are bribing you with food. <laughs> breakfast burritos. No, I'm serious. We will have breakfast burritos here on Saturday morning to eat in, in fellowship and do, do life together. And so we're also gonna make a kind of a photo booth area for families to take photos and stuff like that. And so be the envy of everybody you know on social media, get your photo out before Sunday morning, right? Yeah, I'm just kidding, I don't care if you do that or not, it doesn't matter to me. All right, so if I have not met you yet, my name is Mike, I'm one of the pastors here, so glad to be with you this evening. We are continuing our series going through the Sermon on the Mount, What If Jesus Was Serious? What If Jesus Was Serious? And I, as I, we've been kind of working our way through this, I don't know if you've been noticing some larger themes that I want to kind of touch on real quick before you hit into this week's text. Some larger themes about Jesus saying, hey, it's not just about your actions. It's not just about the outward appearance. It's about what's in your heart. And he challenges over and over again. And he even compares everyone to the most religious people of the day and says, even they don't have it right because it's all about the way they look. He, he challenges something very deep, which I think by the way, is really good news because he starts off the very first thing and says in the whole message is, blessed are you if you have no understanding of any sort of spiritual dynamics. Sweet. Yours is the kingdom of heaven because heaven, I am with you. See, Jesus makes it about him and about him in here. And he resets everything. So even as he's challenging all these different things, the ways in which we interact, I want you to notice it's almost always about the way we interact with God and with others, right? I mean, it literally is the greatest commandment all rolled into one. He's giving us this picture of how do we live life with others and how do we interact with our Father God, okay? So last week, Christy shared about uh, what if Jesus was joking, which I thought was fascinating. We could do a whole sermon series on what if Jesus was joking. She asked a couple of questions specifically. She said, what if Jesus was joking? Then you should shout out all your piety to everybody you know. Look how great I am. What if Jesus was joking? You should buy for yourself everything you see. Always. Debt, what difference does it make? I'm going to go to heaven someday, baby. I'll leave it all to the rest of the world, right? And what if Jesus was joking? We should abandon peace and pursue self-sufficiency. Well, thankfully, he wasn't joking. He actually invites us to something different. Instead, we let others think of us what they will. We brush off our reputation. We brush off how others see us. We choose lives that are sacrificial in our love, our generosity, and our faith. Hey, the whole thing about money, she, just, she addressed some of this last week, but the whole picture of money, man, it consumes our thoughts, right? I mean, there was that great thing from Scott Jatani a few weeks ago that we showed the sketch where all the different impulses that come to us from ads. Man, to let that stuff go and go, man, it's all the Lord's anyways. We're just good stewards of it. 
And then lastly, we seek his kingdom first. This week, as we're heading into this text in Matthew 7, we're going to talk about judging, asking, and blessing. And specifically, I want to look at these texts based on this idea of what is your self-awareness like? Do you have awareness of what's going on inside of you? Do you have awareness of what's going on with others? How aware are we? I don't know if you've heard the term emotional intelligence. There's a book written a few years ago called Primal Leadership. It addresses this idea of emotional intelligence. And in the book, he writes, emotional intelligence is the capability of individuals to recognize their own and other people's emotions, to discern between different feelings and label them appropriately, to use emotional information, i.e. what we're feeling, to guide thinking and behavior and to manage and or adjust emotions to adapt environments or to achieve one's goal. Now, it's not, a, it's not written from a Christian faith perspective, it, but it is this beautiful picture of when you walk into spaces, do you ever have those moments where you go, something's not right? I just feel it. Something's not right. I had this wonderful time where we had dinner with uh, two other couples on Monday night. And I walked in and I went, man, something's not right. And then the other couple, the third couple arrived and I went, yeah, they're fighting. Something's not right there either. And I looked at Christy and I said, I think they're fighting. And she goes, yeah, they were fighting too. And you and I were fighting today too, right? Remember all that? Oh yeah, something wasn't right. I could feel it. I couldn't necessarily explain it. It's this ability to go, something's off. How can I be aware? And sometimes those moments are, we're just aware and we go, it's not my place to get in the middle of it, right? But there are times when, especially with somebody we know and we love, that we can just stop for just a minute and go, hey, are you, are you okay? We're so bad, by the way, Christians. People who follow Jesus, who call themselves Christians, are the worst. How are you doing? Great, great, how are you? No, how are you really doing? Don't give me the lobby answer. Give me the real answer. All right. So today we're going to talk about judging. And I think to judge, to understand this old concept of judging, I think it's tapping into this ability and our desire and our thought processes and how aware are we of ourselves and how aware are we of others. Because I think when we get into the whole language of judging, it has a lot to do with the way we view ourselves and even the way we view others, okay? So um, it can also, by the way, I think lack of self-awareness can be a sign of spiritual arrogance. I think it be, can be a sign of ignorance. Or we're just not, we don't care enough to even ask or wonder. All right, so let's pray, and then we're going to dive into Matthew 7. We're going to go verses 1 through 12 today and see how we do, all right? So, Lord, you are good. I just pray that you would descend upon our hearts and our minds and our emotions with your spirit. Come meet us right now, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would take the things that are your heart today and they would stick and the rest of the stuff would just fall away. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would, for each and every one of us, that you would highlight those moments that you're speaking directly to us, that we would recognize your voice right now. Come speak to us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, a quick word about the word judgment. Before we head into this, the Greek, there's a Greek word judge uh, that has two different meanings, just like it does in English. The one meaning is to discern, this ability to, I can discern that something's different than others, okay? So um, to use my wife's college and uh, my adopted college because my college is really bad at any college sport that I can think of right now, I have adopted into Ohio State. My wife went to Ohio State. For her, Ohio State good, Michigan bad. We can just discern that. We just know that that's the way it works for that family, okay? Right? We all, we all want to practice this together. You want to say it with me? No? Okay. All right. So it's, we can discern one from the other. You can disagree with me, but that's the way I, I they'll see the world filter through those eyes. Discerning. Okay? But it doesn't, it doesn't I'm not judging that all, all Michigan people are bad because actually Christie's father went, was, grew up a Michigan fan. So I get it. All right? And he, he saw the light somewhere along the way. He got saved. But it's discerning. All right? 
I judge the red car to be in better condition than the blue car. I can just see the difference. All right, that's one way to see it. And then the second word is to judge, is to sit in a place of superiority or condemn. Now, our judicial system has judges, and this is their role in the court of law, is there are people who are supposed to be able to sit impartially, hear all the different things presented, and sit in a place where they can judge or condemn or call things out, right? We want them to come and bring justice. They are in places of superiority. But this is the sort of judgment Jesus warns against, especially as we think about spiritual matters and the way people live their lives. Scott Gitani, we love including his different texts and the different sketches. So here's the sketch for this week. Definition A, to discern means we know there's, those are apples, not oranges. And then the definition B is to, um, uh, to judge is to apples are less than oranges. In other words, this thing of saying one is greater than the other, all right? All right, so I may have, when I gave my example of Ohio State, Michigan, actually done the second one, not the first. All right, so Sky Jatani also writes, if Jesus meant for us to avoid acts of discernment, he, it would render all of his teachings, not to mention all of Scripture, meaningless. He does not want us to condemn others, to pass final judgment on them, or declare another person to be irretrievably guilty. Such devaluing of a person is precisely what Jesus' enemies did to him in a way of the world, not in the way of God's kingdom. So he, he's, Jesus isn't saying don't discern. Don't discern that I should go this path and not that path. That's godly wisdom. This is this place where we dial into what the Holy Spirit's leading us. And that's okay. The difference is, is that we get in these places of judging others and their behavior. As we get into this, I just will say real quick, one of the things, one of the reasons I think it's so easy for us to judge others is it really taps into something about us. And this is the key of emotional intelligence, is it, is it helps us feel better about ourselves. And so much of our society thinks, if I put others down, I feel better about me. That is not the way of Jesus. All right, so let's go. Matthew 5, or Matthew 7, rather, verses 1, we'll start 1 through 6. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your feet, under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. All right, let's pause here, and we'll do the second part later. Let's do Matthew one. Let's do one and two again, real quick. Do not judge, or you will be judged. From the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use it will be measured to you. So it's this picture of reciprocal judgment. Okay, now. Jesus declares that a person judging others will also be judged. Judging assumes that it's divine prerogative, it's God's only to bring. And those that seek to judge others now will answer for stepping into God's place. Hey, we are all still committing the same sin Adam and Eve committed in the garden. We're trying to be God. We're trying to be in that place where we are in control. And so when we judge, we end up actually stepping into that place. And by this point in this Sermon on the Mount, nobody should be judging anybody, right? I mean, think about the different things Jesus has talked about. Hey, when you tell people you're going to do something, just do it. You don't have to make a bunch of O's. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Hey, by the way, it's not just murder. It's actually anger in your heart. If you have murder in your heart, you're sinning too. And by the way, all you guys who are like lusting after women, you might as well commit the adultery because you're still sinning in the same way. By the way, you shouldn't, okay? But I just, his point is it's all the same thing. It's about the heart. He's challenging over and over again. By this time, everybody in the crowd should be going, oh man, he read my mail. He's called out Everybody. Everybody. Anybody who's sitting in this moment and goes, yeah, and I'm going to judge others? Like, seriously, what is wrong with you? You have a complete lack of awareness of anybody else in the world. 
if at this point you could still be judging others. If you haven't taken any of this, if there's no conviction in your own heart, then there's something wrong with you. And so this is the challenge that Jesus is saying. Nobody should be judging. In that culture, they, had, uh, they thought of judging as a measuring scale. There was a Jewish maxim that said, as a man measures it, it will be measured back to them. Jesus is using their own common language and vernacular back against them. The Old Testament talked about scales. And most of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, would have agreed outside. But inside, they would have thought, uh-huh. That's not the way it really works. Let me tell you how the world really works. There's something he's getting after in the heart that they weren't quite ready to see. So let's read uh, Matthew 7, 3 through 5 again. I'm, my eyes are bothering me. Let's put some glasses on here real quick. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? It's really hard to read. How can you say to your brother... Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Turns out it's rather hard to read with one eye. This is what we do. We walk around going, hey, I think you got an eyelash in your eye. Oh, oh you mean this thing? No, this is my friend Plank. He goes with me everywhere I go. This is, that's the ridiculousness of what Jesus is challenging there. Why do we walk around with these big, massive things and then go, and they, like seriously, it was really hard to actually read with one eye. And then we're, we're calling out other people's stuff. What in the world? The language there really is more of a twig versus a beam. And why do, we, why do we look at the mistakes of others? Um, we blind ourselves when we rationalize, rationalize away our mistakes, and then we're swift to point out the mistakes of others. Uh, our double standard is a complete lack of awareness, complete lack of, so, of emotional intelligence. And we cannot be aware of the needs of others until we're aware of our own shortcomings, our own struggles our own places of growth. This is not meant to beat up. My desire in this is not to condemn or call out. My desire is to challenge and go, what is the Lord stirring in you? Do you know how much better our world would be if each and every person actually looked in the mirror, kind of emotionally and aware, and with a level of awareness, and looked at their own motives? Like, how different would things be? How different would Aurora be? How different would be Colorado? I mean, things, things have to change internally, person by person, for things to ever change externally in larger structures. The problems for our believers throughout history have been that we're so self-focused that we can justify our own behavior. And regardless of whether you lean left or right, we always judge others on the other side who disagree. We don't ever take time to ask questions, to understand. The world is constantly pushing people to the edges and trying to draw really divisive of lines. There's no room for nuance anymore. And it's so hard to be in that place where we go, I refuse to take any of the labels. I'm going to drop them all. How about we just be people? And we just find out what, what makes each other tick? What makes each other want to get up in the morning? What do we dream about? What do we care about? What do we love? Let's do those things first. And quite honestly, Jesus is mostly hammering the religious elite in this moment. He's getting after their desire to call out everybody else's stuff and not dealing with their own hearts. All right? I think about that and I, man, I think these are the most educated people of the day and they totally missed Jesus. They totally missed the things that God was calling them into. And it just actually breaks my heart because we have way more knowledge than they ever had at our fingertips. Did you know that? You have more knowledge than any religious leader in Jesus' day ever had at their fingertips. 
but knowledge does not equate to heart change. There's got to be a place where something flips, where we go there, but for the grace of God, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. All right, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, you may trample them. they may trample them under their feet and tear, turn and tear you to pieces. Maybe I need my glasses back on. So really quickly, I think, he's, I think Jesus is comparing the Pharisees to dogs and pigs. Um, not, not the best analogy, I think, for those sitting in the audience. And, um, and I think it's, uh, he's challenging them, this pe- picture of, like, there are going to be people who are not going to be ready to hear truth. Don't even waste your time. Let it go. Let it go. Some people just aren't ready to hear it. I remember I, years ago when I first moved to Colorado, I was managing hotels. And I had a guy who was not a believer, who came out and helped me kind of think through how to run a hotel, how to manage and all the different facets of it. And when we got to talking about sales, I'm like, I know nothing about sales and I refuse to lie to people. He goes, good. He goes, no problem. He goes, sales is not trying to convince people to buy something because no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I went, ooh, that's good. That sounds like something Jesus would say, right? So this picture of when we get to know people, then we have room to speak. But sometimes when we just start throwing out all of our knowledge, it's like throwing pearls before swine or pigs or, or dogs. Proverbs 9.23, do not speak to fools, for they will scorn your prudent words. As my dad used to tell me all the time when I was a kid, just keep your mouth shut. And I was like, Dad, I think that's not the whole proverb. He goes, yeah, there's something else about better to be thought a fool, and, but just keep your mouth shut, son. I'm like, okay. All right. This discernment required there to offer wisdom, to ask for God to help you know when those moments are. But I I just would encourage you, like, if there's not relationship, those aren't the moments necessarily to share your wisdom or to share your knowledge. Okay? Just live life with people. All right, verse 7 through 12. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, Those, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, I think he's talking to me, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do for you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. All right, we're going to kind of, uh, we're going to move through this rather quickly, but let me, let me share something about seven through eight real quick that I think is really interesting. I've not seen before until I read this again and read Sky's kind of take on this. Ask and will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. So when, when I have typically read that verse, I've thought of that in terms of my relationship with my Heavenly Father. I've thought about it in terms of prayer, the way in which I communicate to God, which I still think is true because the next part talks about God wants to give us good gifts. And it's also in the context of the Lord's Prayer. But if you think about, I actually think this text could be the transition from judging back to prayer. And so if you think about it, that standpoint, this whole idea of asking and seeking and knocking, and it's, it's a picture of the way we live life with others, that there is a other-centric approach to this. So I think the challenge for us, and I think this ties right into this whole thing of this awareness and self-awareness, do we approach others just simply asking for what we need? Are we willing to receive from others? By the way, sometimes we're the worst at that. If you're having a difficult time and you need help, actually ask for what you need. Not for less than you need because you feel like it sounds better, but actually what you need. Now, people may say, I can't do that or I can't help or we whatever. But when we, when we sit short, what we do is we leave this gap this expectation gap where we put people in this weird space where we hope and expect that they would step into it, but we've not actually asked them to. 
Now, I realize my personality is more attuned to this kind of behavior. Like, I am really direct. People who are around me tell me that all the time in very loving terms. But I am very direct, and so this is natural for me. But I do think there's a, a challenge here about the way we live life with others. Don't manipulate. Don't try to pull somebody in. Don't try to sell somebody. If you want somebody to do something, ask them. If you need somebody's help, say, hey, would you be willing to help me with this? And we're, we're bad at that. Because we, we immediately go to, if they ask me, I don't want to do it. <laughs> right? I'm the only one who does that? Oh, okay, thanks. You guys are all really good people. All right. So I think it's tied into the way we live life with others. There's a whole thing about differentiation here and self-awareness. I think it goes back to our emotional intelligence, these different moments. We had this uh, wonderful moment today on the phone. Uh, my my mother-in-law was, was supposed to come out and visit, and she, her sister, her younger sister is dying in, in hospice and, and could be any day now. And we, my daughter, whose birthday it is tomorrow, um, we can all sing happy birthday to Evelyn later, but whose birthday it is tomorrow was like, hey, can I talk to grandma about my birthday card, my money? And I'm like, man, that's, you know, I had this moment where I'm like, maybe this isn't the right moment to ask that question, right? Grandma's a better person than I am. She handled it really well. But it's that being aware, maybe there's not always the right moment to ask, but how then do you step into those moments and, and actually ask for what you want? And what I love about my daughter is she actually asked for what she wanted. It wasn't this kind of subtle thing and hoping grandma would get there. And she was very clear. I thought it was great. All right. Verse nine. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Nope. Scare snakes. If you then thought you were, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to the children, how much more will your father in heaven good gifts to those who ask him? Your father, God, loves you. He loves you. He wants to give you good gifts. And sometimes we go to God and like, like he doesn't already know what's going on inside of us, right? Well, so God, like if you could like help out a little bit with whatever, and then if you do that piece, then would you do a little bit more? Just ask for the whole enchilada, right? He's God. He loves you. Here's the challenge. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is no. I, I, for those who are parents, you understand this. There are moments when you tell your kids no, and they throw the fit of all fits, and you go, yeah, we're about to find out how much I really love my kid right now because I want to give them what they want so they'll stop whining, but that's not going to be good for them. How much more does your Father God love you? That he says no sometimes. Scott Jatani says, when the Lord says no to our desires, it's because he loves us too much to say yes. He wants to offer us something far more valuable. He offers us himself. The goal to this life is not that he with the most toys wins. That bumper sticker is a lie. The goal of this life is simply Jesus. It's just Jesus. There are lots of people who have lots of ways in which they think about life and peace and, and religion and ways in which we treat people better. But the only one that's found on a person is Jesus. Following Jesus means that we lay down some of these things and, and the relationship with him is more important than what we get out of it. And then we're going to finish this last verse. So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. Not do to others what they have done to you, but what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So, uh, you know, remember the old bracelets, the WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? Maybe we should make some new bracelets that say WWIW, what would I want? And what I would want is the way I'm going to then treat others. Maybe that's just the filter. If you're a person who likes pain, maybe you should get a different bracelet. Maybe we find something else. But, but this idea of actually treating others out of a desire of going, if, if, I, if this, were, this conversation or this moment were flipped around, how would I want to be treated? How would I want people to respond? 
I, um, I'll share one last little thing and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here. I, I had this really interesting moment in the coffee shop this week. Um, it's my favorite place to be besides my, my chair. Everybody has that. I have a chair. But besides my chair, the coffee shop is my favorite place to be. And I was in this coffee shop and, um, and I ordered a drink and I ordered it hot. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I ordered it iced. But I almost always order it hot. And they know me in this coffee shop. And so they made it wrong. They made it hot. And, and in between, while they were making mine, somebody else came up and was just berating this poor barista. I mean, just berating them. Like they messed up their drink or whatever. It was just, it, I just found myself just like moved with compassion. Hey, if, a little side note, be people of Jesus. As you go out to restaurants and coffee shops and places of business and people are serving or waiting on you, treat them with incredible kindness. Because most of the rest of the world is unraveling right now. And here's a chance for us to be salty and lit, right? That we could actually go out and be the people of Jesus that treat others with kindness. Let's be those people. What a great opportunity to actually be salt and light in this culture. All we have to do is just be nice. Because that's really will stand out right now for most of the rest of the world. People are unraveling. People are freaking out because they got some sort of the milk wrong, or I don't remember what it was. You know, I just was like, I found myself thinking, oh. But then I found the Lord going, stop judging. You're working on this message right now. And I was like, all right, Lord, forgive me. I bless them. Yeah. All right. And bless their heart in kind of a way. No, I just bless them. All right. All right. So let's finish with this. Uh, I think there's an inside out approach Jesus is advocating for here. Inside is self-awareness. We need to seek some level of self-awareness. Look inside honestly. God, what's one thing? Here's the great question. What's one thing that's keeping me from more of you? Keeping me from having more life with you? What's one area of my life? Just one. If you ever wrestle with, I don't know that I hear the voice of the Lord very well, I promise you when you ask that question, God answers really quickly. Because the enemy is not going to answer and go, yeah, I really wish you would stop doing that, right? If you hear something, that's probably the Lord, not the enemy, all right? The other great question is, Lord, who's one person I should be praying for? The enemy is also not going to answer that question for you either, all right? Ask questions about ourselves to those who know us. Hey, how do I come across how do, I, how, do I, how do I seem to, towards others? Uh, the, the staff here at Smoky Hill, you guys are amazing. We have a great team of people. And as I, we've been living life together for the last 18 months, they're starting to get to know us. And there are moments where I go, whoa, whoa too much. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. Thanks. No, but they've become really good at going, hey, what's wrong? You're off today. This doesn't feel like normal you. And that's what we need, people who know us well enough to ask those questions. So ask others to reflect back to you. What is it about me? I remember when my son, my oldest son was in high school, um, I started working with him on this whole thing of emotional intelligence and just trying to help him be aware of others around him and be aware of himself. And he's, he's super extroverted, loved to be around people. And so he would want to enter every conversation. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. did you see that person over there was waiting to talk? And you just stepped all over them. Oh, no, I didn't see that. So we, we, would, we would coach a little bit. I would do a little bit of coaching, help him think through that. Man, one of the coolest things was by the time he left for college, he was so comfortable. He was the guy that all the other kids in college were going, hey, would you go talk to that professor with me? Because he wasn't afraid of talking with adults and communicating and having conversation. If you find yourself right now feeling a little bit of shame or embarrassment, that's not the voice of the Lord. That's the enemy, Okay. God's desire is to bring us life to the fullness. The other inside piece is that people matter more than being right. People matter more than being right. I wonder how different politics would be in this country if our politicians responded that way. That people matter more than being right. By the way, I was not raised in a home this way. My home was being right was the most important thing. Good thing there was no Google when I was growing up. 
People matter more than being right. And when we stand in judgment, what we're saying is, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm devaluing people to be right. If you find yourself listening to this going, I wish so-and-so could hear this. Okay, I'll let you work that one out for yourself. And I would say that we also have to be really careful that we don't step in the place of motives. That moments of people do, choices they make, actions they have, don't necessarily lead to the motives that we think they lead to. That we need to be careful to get to know things before we just call it out, okay? All right. Even if you know people's hearts, sometimes you don't see the full picture of their past experiences. This is a maxim that I think has been very true in all of my life. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. When we're in places of pain, we lash out. We're not ourselves. We don't always handle things well. And I'm just going to tell you, two years, two years we've been in this pandemic. Two years. I promise you people are on edge. And so our ability to walk in with a soft, kind voice, show love, can bring peace to moments. We can, be, we can be some level of change agents. We can be salt and light, salty and lit. Sky Jatani, when we condemn others, we are declaring they have no worth. They do not matter to us or God. The impulse to judge is often a way of a, a way of evaluating or elevating rather ourselves to devaluing others. This is a challenge. Man, God created every other human on this earth and you. And so the way he loves you is the way he loves others. Now they may not have responded to that. They may be running from it, they may be hiding from it, they may be ignoring it. But it's not a lack of God's love. And so f- Far be it from us to stand in the place of going, God, that person you created is not worth it. It's not our call. It's not our place. It's not our right. All right, the outside piece of this is I think we're supposed to live at peace with and for others. No manipulating, no scheming. We treat others with respect. We try to be honest and loving. We ask for what we need. We don't try to lead people there. We should live in a way that our lives benefit others. We should live in a way that we think about others even by the choices we make. How will this affect others? How will this affect the people that live with me? How will this affect people I do life with? There's a great book Arun McManus wrote called Wide Awake, and he says, what are, you supposed to, what are you supposed to do that will benefit others? As you start to think about dreams, what are you supposed to do that will benefit others? Be careful that our dreams don't become someone else's nightmares. Be careful. The outside piece, too, is that we, there are times when we need to be honest with people and say, hey, this isn't okay. Years ago, when I was my first round with working at Smoky Hill Vineyard, I uh, had a reputation for being really blunt. I keep saying that, but it's true. I really, I, I, like, all of a sudden, I'm really nice now, but it's taken 20 years. It's taken a while. So I had a reputation for being really, really blunt. Like, and I had another pastor that was on staff with us at the time. He came to me, he goes, Mike, he goes, man, he goes, you got to be nicer. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, man, what you do is like surgery without anesthesia. And, he, and I said, oh, and he goes, he goes, he goes my, my problem is, is that sometimes I do a whole bunch of anesthesia. In other words, I tell a lot of love and I never actually do the surgery. And I said, huh. I said, well, I can be nicer. Can you be more honest? And he goes, that is what I'm talking about right there. That's it. That's the surgery without anesthesia. So this picture of how will you know when it's time to tell people something's off? You'll know when your relationship is deep enough that you have the equity to share those places. How will you know? When you can look somebody in the eye and say, I need to share something with you. Are you could, could I share something I think could be a little bit hard for you to hear? Ask permission. If they say no, then you're not there yet, okay? And how will you know when there's time for church judgment? Well, let me just be really clear. You you don't have to know that. We'll know. We'll set those moments for you. 
But Paul, in the middle of calling out a church in Corinth for incredible lack of awareness, for showing, for showing grace where God was not giving grace, he actually talks about this thing. He says, he says, here's what you should do with that person, kick them out. But then he goes on to say, verse 12 out of 1 Corinthians 5, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So he's talking about specifically with somebody who's in the church, calling themselves a believer, who's sleeping with a stepmother. It's all bad. Everything about us would go, whoa, that's, that's, that's too far, right? It's all bad. But he's telling the church leaders, kick them out. Stop showing grace where there's no grace to be shown. But we're supposed to be careful. That it's not our place to judge people who don't know Jesus. We can't judge what their, their motives are, their mantra, or what, what direction they're headed. We love that's what we've been asked to do. Greg talked about a few weeks ago, we love the people that the world would call our enemies. We love. That's what we're supposed to do. Worship team, if you'll come on back up. People are more important than processes. Love them to health. And I just want to give one last quick word about boundaries. If you're not sure where the boundaries are, it's okay for you to set some boundaries for yourself. If there's some relationships that are really creating problems, there's nothing wrong with setting boundaries. And if you find yourself stuck in where those are, uh, please see one of us. We'll help connect you with somebody. If, you're really, if it's a place that's really stuck, particularly family system dynamics, we'll help recommend somebody who can help you process through those things. Be aware. Be aware. It starts here. It starts in our own hearts. And then it spreads out. And then we take that awareness to the way we treat others. We be aware of them. Loving others is incredibly messy. It's incredibly messy. It's hard work. Do you know why it's hard work? Because you're in the middle of it. And because you come with all of your stuff. Because I'm in the middle of it and I come with all my stuff. Because they're in the middle of it and it, they come with all their stuff. Show some grace, all right? If you are joining us online, please grab some communion elements. We're going to take a few minutes and we're going to go through communion. If you're in the room and you don't have your elements, please let one of our staff members know and they'll be glad to give you some communion elements. Rather than reading through the, the text on uh, 1 Corinthians 11, which I normally do for communion, I actually want to just lead us through a quick moment of prayer, if I can. I feel like maybe there's something here the Lord wants to kind of bring some, some freedom to some of us, some places that he wants to come and minister his love. And so we're just going to take a moment and get our hearts right, okay? So... Lord Jesus, even more with your presence, come. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts. I just think that if you find yourself having certain people come up in your mind during this time, that I just want to encourage you to take them to the Lord, release them to the Lord. If there are people you need to forgive, forgive them. If there are places where you need to ask for forgiveness from the Lord for judging, do that. Let's take that stuff to the Lord. Let's get our hearts clean. If you need language on how to do that, it's just, Lord, I forgive so-and-so or God, forgive me for judging so-and-so. It is simple. See, the, what we're doing today in communion is we're remembering the work that Jesus did on the cross. 
And the work he did on the cross was for these very kinds of things so that we don't have to walk around with guilt and shame and condemnation. And that we don't have to walk around with unforgiveness. And we can leave these things with him. So thank you, Jesus, for the work you did on the cross, for the ways in which you brought life to us, opportunity for relationship. find yourself right now going, I'm not sure I fully understand this. I don't even know that I would call myself a follower of Jesus. I just want to encourage you. The process is really simple, but it will cost you everything. It will cost you your very life in pursuit of life with him, but it will bring tremendous freedom. The process is simple. It's Jesus, I need you. I can't do this anymore on my own. Forgive me for the ways I've tried to control and be the God of my life. Come meet me where I am. So let's take the elements together. So Father God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And we now, we take the bread together in remembrance of his sacrifice on the cross. Let's take together. Likewise, Lord, we thank you for uh, the gift that, that we all we have to do is turn to receive. So let's take the cup together. Let's stand. have opportunities to worship together and to pray with and for each other. Our prayer team will be on either side of the stage if you'd like someone to come alongside you and what you think God might be saying and doing in you today. And as Mike was speaking, I was just reminded that one of the names, um, descriptions of Holy Spirit is the counselor. And in this idea of being self-aware, how is it that we can see things in ourselves that we can't see, right? Uh, we're kind of stuck there. The things that other people maybe notice about ourselves that we are blind to and uh, just inviting the Holy Spirit as our counselor to show us what we cannot see without the grace of God, the, without the power of God. Um, so we're going to sing a song and in, inviting the Holy Spirit to come in more power and authority to help us become more aware of uh, God's movement in this moment right now. And I would encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit, what might God want to reveal to you today that um, we can't see on our own? And as Mike said, it's all for the sake of freedom, all for the sake of the fullness of life that God has intended for us. So Holy Spirit, we do invite you to come and, and speak freely, to move freely. We need uh, your vision to be able to see what is true about our own hearts and our own minds, the things that we are blind to. Holy Spirit, you see so perfectly. So come and speak to us in your in your true and gentle and honest voice. Show us a path towards freedom. As children we come with arms open wide So desperate for you So in need of your Touch your heart. 
pray a prayer of blessing over you. We open our hands as a posture of receiving good gifts from a good Father who knows before we speak what we need, but who treasures our, our words and our prayers as a sign of relationship and friendship and trust as we come to Him. So I bless you as daughters and sons your name and your story, your needs and your desires, your places of desperation and your places of greatest joy, all deeply known by the God of the universe who's made you, who loves you, who does not leave you alone, who sees your sorrow and meets you with comfort who sees your joy and celebrates with you. I bless you to be people who live out of that knownness, who live with confidence, who live with courage, who live with the kindness and generosity of a God who's extended you the same. I bless you to be light in a dark world, bless you to be the love of the good father and the perfect son and the present and powerful Holy Spirit. Go in the grace that God has richly poured out in great measure for you and your particular and beautiful life. Amen and amen. Hey guys, Mike and Christy Colley here. We're the lead pastors at SHV, and we wanted to personally invite you to join us in person on Saturday nights for service at 5 p.m., worship and community. You know, there's a special thing about actually being with other people yeah. in the room and learning what life with God looks like. And the SHV community is full of incredible people from different backgrounds, and we're all learning how to follow Jesus together. Yeah, so whatever your story, whatever your history, whatever your dreams for the future, you have a place at the table here at SHV. Yeah, and we would love to get the chance to know you better. And not just we in a, in a large sense, but for Christy and I, we would love to get to know you. So if you are around on a Saturday and it's your first time in person, please come say hello to us. We'd love to have a chance to meet you. Yeah, and remember, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. We are all better together. And we hope to see you soon on Saturday nights. Yeah. God bless. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you soon on a Saturday.